following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In Gnosis, we always seek to study the laws that govern the expression of the psyche, the soul or consciousness. And we seek to understand our place in a cosmological scale in relation to God and to our current physical existence. And it's important to note that Gnosis, as a Greek term, signifies direct knowledge. It does not mean theory. It does not mean something that is uh, interesting intellectually or something to debate. It is not a philosophy to be argued for or against. Instead, it pertains to our direct knowledge of fundamental laws within the universe. And so it is by understanding these laws and how they apply to our physical life is that we will be able to advance in spiritual life. So today we're going to discuss what people typically call reincarnation. And uh, we're going to clarify many misconceptions about the term and how it applies to our present level of being. So we use the terms return and recurrence in replace of what people typically denominate reincarnation. Most individuals believe that uh, reincarnation is the reincorporation of the psyche within different bodies. But in truth, within Gnostic esotericism, reincarnation has a much more uh, rigorous application to spiritual development. Reincarnation means to willingly choose one's body, to be cognizant of one's incarnation within a certain physical circumstance or situation. It also refers to the manifestation of Christ, the supreme deity, divinity, the energy of God within a specific individual or initiate that has fully prepared him or herself through development. So, typically what people denominate reincarnation or the transference of the soul within different bodies, we call that return. Because all of us typically do not remember where we came from because we lack cognizance. We don't typically have that direct knowledge of who we were in past lives. Instead, we have returned to a new body without any cognizance or remembrance. Specifically, if we don't have cognizance of where we came from, who we were, where we have been, what, who or what was our past personality and identity, name, culture, it means that we have mechanically returned to this body. It means that we have not chosen our specific incarnation. Recurrence is another matter pertaining to cyclical events within one's physical life. The repetition of circumstances. And we're going to explain these three terms more in depth in terms of our relationship to uh, these laws. In synthesis, we have this image known as the Bhava Chakra within Buddhism. 
and we gave a, it was a beautiful course online on our website, which specifically explains this symbol, which is essential to Buddhism. We're not going to explain all the intricacies of this image, because we have a course available, and uh, it would take many lectures to explain it. In synthesis, this image is a wheel pertaining to the cyclical uh, manifestation of beings within different uh, levels of existence. We see that there is a figure gripping this wheel with his teeth. This figure is known as Yama, which means death. In the center, we have six levels or modes of existence. We have the humans, the demigods, the gods, the animals, the demons, and the hungry ghosts. These are different types of psychology, psychological ways of being. Because bhava means becoming, a way of being, a level of being, as we say in this studies. Now, uh, People have typically denominated this image as the wheel of samsara, which is uh, mistaken. It's really the bhava chakra, way, or wheel of becoming. Because depending on our psychological state, depending on our attachments or lack thereof, will determine whether or not we cycle through these different uh, states of being. Now, uh, these beings within this wheel of uh, suffering within different states of uh, attachment, cling to a mistaken sense of identity. And the essential uh, tenet of Buddhism, which we'll explain in relation to this study, pertains to how one's psychological way of being attracts one's life. Our psychological state determines our life. For as uh, Buddha taught in the Dhammapada, mind precedes phenomena. We become what we think, and this determines our life. If we perform good actions, then good, actions, good results will follow, like the cart following an ox. And if we perform bad deeds, then likewise, bad results follow. This uh, is particularly relevant in relation to the doctrine of karma, which we're going to explain but in synthesis, this image pertains or portrays how all of us, all beings within this universe, cycle within this ever-recurring and ever-rotating wheel of becoming. There is no freedom from suffering within these realms. Now, uh, all beings within these realms are subject to laws of nature of which they have no control. And typically it is our lack of cognizance which produces our suffering. Now, uh, whether or not we have many uh, blessings, many, many uh, gifts, or many uh, types of uh, comforts, these in the end will be lost. These in, uh, in, uh, in the end will be reduced to dust. Therefore, we have to analyze our psychology and really determine what is it that's important to know. And so this is why we study return, recurrence, and reincarnation, because we seek to understand the laws of which we are subjected. Because if we are ignorant of these laws, then we cannot change our way of being. But if we are cognizant of these laws in experience and how we, uh, due to our state of mind, cycle within different types or states of being, of suffering, it is by knowing these things that we can change it. That we can uh, transcend this wheel. As we see in this image, there is a figure of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, an illuminated initiate or being, that has transcended this wheel, has escaped these uh, different states of being, these levels of being, and has transcended this, these cycles of manifestation of being and of uh, cyclical existence. So uh, again, this is not a theory. This is something we need to verify with ex within experience. 
Now, typically, when we think of uh, reincarnation or return, we think of Hinduism or Buddhism, and typically do not acknowledge that this doctrine of transmigration of souls has existed even within Western doctrine. It sadly has been manipulated or taken out of uh, the scriptures and the teachings of uh, Christianity especially. We find the Greek figure Pythagoras, who is the great master of uh, the White Lodge, those souls that have transcended that wheel of becoming and have entered into a perfect state of peace and cognizance. Some people call them supermen, initiates, bodhisattvas. Pythagoras is precisely such an individual who taught that all beings and all things cycle and manifest in uh, cyclical ways. And as a result of that, they suffer. Now, what's interesting to note is that uh, in this image, we have uh, Pythagoras. The name Pythagoras comes from Pythios, which means or signifies the name of Apollo. Apollo in uh, Greek is uh, Christ, a figure of the solar, uh, solar god, the sun deity. Pythagoras also has the name Agora, which means market, marketplace. Now, uh, the serpent of the market, we could say, if we uh, have studied German esotericism, we find the teachings of Friedrich Nietzsche, who also knew this science, in which he explained how he tried to give this type of doctrine of the retur eternal return, which we're going to explain to the public, teaching in the marketplace. Pythagoras precisely had the wisdom of the serpent in his teaching, the wisdom of sexual alchemy. Because as we explain, the serpent pertains to the Divine Mother Kundalini. And so he was that great master who taught amongst the markets, t or teaching and gathering disciples, through the wisdom of the serpent. Like uh, Nietzsche did it fictionally through his Iranian prophet in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The word metempsychosis, if we break the word down, comes from the Greek metempsychote, metempsychoste. Meta refers to after or beyond. And empsychos means to animate. So that which is beyond our animated form. Anima in Latin means soul as well. And it pertains to how the soul animates different bodies with the different existences before and after one's current uh, state of knowledge. And uh, meta also related with m to be within the soul, psyche, metempsychosis. So I'll quote for you uh, some, Im uh, some early documentation about the teachings of Pythagoras, which elaborates the doctrine of uh, transmigration. On the subject of reincarnation, Zephanes, Xenophanes bears witness in an elegy which begins, Now I will turn to another tale and show the way. What he says about Pythagoras runs thus, once they say that he was passing by when a puppy was being whipped. And he took pity and said, Stop, do not beat it. For it is the soul of a friend that I recognized when I heard it giving tongue. This is from Diogenes in his book Laertius, uh, book 8, verse 36. So uh, this is an early documentation about the teachings of transmigration. And I will be specific to state that Metempsychosis or transmigration pertains to the manifestation of the soul within different types of bodies, not just human body to human body, because that pertains to return, and we're going to explain more deeply. But transmigration first is how the soul manifests from different elemental kingdoms of nature within different bodies, whether from the mineral state, the plant state, to the animal state, and then to the humanoid state. This cycle of how the soul migrates within different kingdoms of nature through forces of evolution, it pertains to transmigration. How the soul migrates within different bodies, different types of bodies. Return pertains to how one manifests again and again within a specific type of body, whether mineral, plant, animal, or humanoid. 
So return pertains to one's return to a, the same type of body within a specific type of kingdom. And we're going to elaborate about these kingdoms in, in more specifically. But uh, Pythagor- uh, Pythagoras also teaches, or his doctrine was elaborated by Porphyrius. Porphyrius, excuse me, in his life of Pythagoras. Nonetheless, the following became universally known. First, that Pythagoras maintains that the soul is immortal. Second, that it changes into other kinds of living things. Third, that events recur in certain cycles and that nothing is ever absolutely new. And fourth, that all living things should be regarded as akin. Pythagoras seems to have been the first to bring these beliefs into Greece. So those people who are of the Western type of mentality who reject the doctrine of reincarnation or return should study Pythagoras because uh, a great master of the Greek doctrine, he explained and firmly taught these laws within nature. So it's interesting that we have this document here. It states that the soul is immortal. So Einstein said energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes form. Energy becomes matter. Matter becomes energy. So the soul can change type states of consciousness and form, but it is never lost. It simply migrates. Second, uh, that it changes into other kinds of living things, as we mentioned. Third, that events recur in certain cycles and that nothing is ever absolutely new. This pertains to the doctrine of recurrence. How in our life, certain uh, states of being and our mentality, our mind, our heart, or physical circumstances around us constantly recur. In our physical life, we have many things that, are psych- that appear psychically and that we need to become aware of. This is recurrence. Return pertains to how the soul enters into new bodies within a specific kingdom. So return for us is to return into a new humanoid body. Return for animals is to return into a new animal body, whether it's an eagle or a serpent or whatever variety that exists. Return for plants pertains to animating new plant bodies. And then uh, even the minerals have a soul which transmit the vital forces of the earth. They too have physicality, body, within the minerals and metals. We say that the minerals and metals are the nervous system of the planet and that they too have soul. You take a look at the Kirlian camera of the, I believe it was a Russian scientist, photographed how minerals and plants and animals have aura, have light, have an energy. Likewise, it's important to note that minerals have a type of life and soul, and that we know them as gnomes and pygmies within different uh, ancient lore or Irish folklore, different traditions. And that the souls of plants also, or elementals of plants, have life. And that they animate those physical bodies that we see as as trees or flowers or different plants. And so, uh, likewise, animals have soul. Because the word anima means soul. So people who affirm that animals don't have a type of soul, like many fundamentalists think, are completely mistaken. And so they should study the teachings of Pythagoras. Since Christianity is founded upon Greek dialectics and uh, Greek teachings. So, as we were explaining, there are different kingdoms within the Department of Nature. We use this image to explain the different kingdoms of uh, elemental consciousness. So, this wheel or this diagram portrays those different kingdoms that I've just mentioned. When the soul first animates a new body or manifests from the absolute source, we know we call it absolute, we call it the ocean of Christ, the light. That soul emanates down what we call the tree of life in Kabbalah as different stages or degrees of matter, energy, and consciousness until reaching the physical plane. In the physical plane, that soul enters into mineral states. That soul or anima animates mineral states. And so the minerals are, have a very uh, simple type of consciousness. But they are the life force of this planet. And so this mineral kingdom is needed to sustain our world as we know it. In terms of all the vitality and forces that plants receive, that the vitality from our, the vitality of the water we drink. 
relates to uh, how the mineral forces are saturating this planet. The soul transmigrates between these different kingdoms through the force, or initially through the force of what we call evolution. Evolution is the, we say, is progression, development, um, growth. And so the souls that are in the mineral kingdom need to gain experience within that kingdom, learning to transmit forces of Christ within the mineral and metal state for the benefit of the universe and the humanity. Once the soul has developed as a mineral, it can progress and evolve, enter or transmigrate into the plant kingdom, into plant states or plant forms. Likewise, the souls of plants also transmit energies. If we look at uh, the trees or the flowers, how they reach up towards the space, it's because the energies of life are now initiating a return upward towards the source. And so plants, the elementals, uh, souls of the plant kingdom, help transmit vital forces that are necessary for this planet. Once the soul has evolved, developed the cognizance and mastery of the level of the plant kingdom, that soul transmigrates into the animal kingdom. It evolves to that state. Now in the animal kingdom, something unique happens. In the animal kingdom, the souls of uh, animals are given instinct. They receive a new type of psychology. They're ingrained with a type of uh, instinctual force given to them by the gods, the angels or Elohim that the Bible speaks of. This is a necessary stage within the evolution of the soul because there are certain forces that are transmitted by the animals that are necessary for the planet. And now animals, they learn in this kingdom to perform what we call fornication. And fornication is the expulsion of the sexual energy. So amongst animals, that is natural. They obey the laws of nature and when they feel excited sexually, they copulate with their partner in order to procreate the species. This is a very natural tendency amongst animals. And now animals, they do so and they propagate their species and they gain experience within the con their consciousness at that level. Now, once they have finally progressed and gained a high degree of consciousness within the uh, animal kingdom, they can then enter or transmigrate into a humanoid body. Now, what's uh, interesting to note is that we don't call this the human kingdom, as ironic as that might sound. We say humanoid because really all of us are animal souls that have incarnated into humanoid bodies. Again, remember that the word uh, anima is soul. The special gift that humanoids receive is the intellect. Now, the intellect is a machine or a vehicle that will allow us to learn to differentiate between good and evil. Animals, plants, and minerals don't know that difference. They don't have intellect. They have a type of mind, a type of uh, understanding or perception, but it is not intellectual. It is not, there's no rationalization there. There's no thesis, antithesis, theory, anti-theory, concept, anti-concept. That is a specific demarcation, or the demarcation between the human and kingdom with the previous kingdoms. It's precisely that we, are, we have the intellect. And this is a gift that we need to learn how to use for divinity. Now, that is why Samael and Vior stated with clarity that, uh, the founder of this tradition, that really we are intellectual animals, meaning we are souls with intellect. We have not yet entered into what we call the human kingdom. And if you look in this image, we find a diagram of our, a path leading upward from the humanoid kingdom towards what we call the heavens, the superior kingdoms, represented in uh, as the tree of life as we have in this book available here. Now, uh, the word hume, man, is interesting. The word hume is spirit. Man is manas, or mind. And being refers to divinity. So a human being is an individual that has incarnated their being, has incarnated God, and a mind that is fully united with hume, 
the spirit, divinity. As we are now, we are not that. And it is necessary to recognize this fact because if we meditate and examine our mind, what we will find are a lot of disordered thoughts, worries, preoccupations, fears, frustrations, anger, resentment, negative psychological elements, which had emerged initially from the animal kingdom. Now, animals, due to the act of fornication, the act of expelling that energy in order to, the sexual force in order to procreate, they develop what we call ego, but to a very minor degree. They develop a type of uh, psychological element or some sense of self as a result of that act because the sexual energy is creative. It needs to, uh, in animals, it is used to create life, physical life. And likewise, this energy creates animal mind or uh, ego to a minor degree. The problem is once we have entered into the human kingdom, we carry these animal tendencies within our psyche. Notice that in the Bible, when Adam and Eve, symbol of a primordial humanity, uh, were in the garden, they were told specifically by Jehovah Elohim, in Hebrew meaning the Holy Spirit, Jehovah Elohim said, you know, of this tree of knowledge you shall not eat, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Of the tree of the garden you may freely eat, the tree of life. You may, uh, symbolically it's representing how the soul on that level initially knew God and experienced the entire tree of life representing the human being in this totality, uh, reflecting the light of God. But humanity, using the intellect to justify animal passion, did not obey that commandment given by divinity to, towards that ancient humanity, which is lost within um, our memory within the, these times, but is well documented within ancient traditions. Uh, humanity indulged in that forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, which we precisely state is the sexual energy the most powerful force that we carry within our psyche and within our bodies and our, in our spirit, in our mind. This energy, which has been evolving progressively through the inferior kingdoms, has, gained, has complicated itself and manifested itself finally into a humanoid body in which the souls have finally entered into a humanoid state. The problem is that with the intellect, uh, Human beings have used that to justify animal passion, as I stated, which is the expulsion of that sexual energy. This in itself fortifies those animalistic elements called ego. Anger, pride, vanity, laziness, lust, etc. The human beings of the superior kingdom, the angels, the Elohim, obey the, com- the sixth commandment of Moses, thou shalt not fornicate meaning to use that energy in purity. Now, the angels told that ancient humanity, well, previously you used this energy to procreate as animals. Now you can't do that anymore if you want to enter into the higher kingdoms. Notice that evolution as a processor of development of the soul takes the soul and trans- uh, the soul transmigrates from these different kingdoms to the humanoid state through the process of evolution meaning there's no effort involved. It's mechanical. It's a wave that's taking one up like a wheel on a, on a ferry ride or on a Ferris wheel, excuse me. At the top, the soul has a choice to follow superior laws or to continue with an animal passion and to indulge in those el- negative psychological elements and fortify them. As we see in this image, we have a devolving uh, current meaning a retrogressive descent back into those inferior kingdoms. The force of devolution pertains to destruction, uh, our uh, disintegration, retrogression, to go backwards. Those souls that don't enter into the human, human kingdom, the kingdom of the angels, let themselves be swallowed by the devolving forces of nature. Because if those souls do not want to enter the kingdom of the human, the human beings, the angels, if they don't willingly want to destroy their defects, 
by working with uh, Tantra and alchemy to ascend inward and upward to God. Unfortunately, they have to be disintegrated in the process known as hell. Now, hell refers to not only a place, but a state of suffering. And what religions call hell is really a type of, uh, we can call a recycling plant, is a type of analogy. It's not an eternal place of damnation where no one ever escapes. That is a ludicrous interpretation. Instead, it's a uh, retrogressive decline back into animal bodies, into plant bodies, into mineral bodies, as the soul transmigrates back down towards the interior of the earth, which is known as the submerged mineral kingdom, or the abyss, hell, avici, the Tartarus, the infernos, given different names and different traditions. That's in order that the soul can be liberated from the ego that has swallowed it, that has encapsulated it. Because ego takes the soul and conditions it in a shell. This is the meaning of the genie of Aladdin's lamp. If you break the shell, the break the lamp, you free the genie, which is the soul that can perform miracles. But sadly, those who don't want to disintegrate their ego uh, will actually as an act of compassion by divinity. Those souls are retrogressively sent down into the inferior kingdoms, descending down into the interior of the earth, in order to be disintegrated. And we're going to elaborate on this further. But that's an order that the ego can be destroyed. That's an order that the, uh, those negative psychological elements can be eliminated so that the soul, the genie, can be liberated and uh, released back into nature. Now, this is a cycle, as I mentioned to you. Many souls, they ascend through evolution up the different kingdoms, attain a humanoid body but choose to follow the devolving path to let themselves be swallowed by nature. And therefore they retrogress and go back towards these inferior kingdoms until entering to the, the abyss or hell to be disintegrated. When the soul is liberated, it enters again into a mineral state and the cycle continues. So this is a type of repetition or uh, transmigration that we need to be aware of, not just intellectually, but from experience. Now, uh, we study the laws of, uh, or the, of the superior kingdoms because if we're in these studies, it's because, or we're interested in these studies, is because we're tired of suffering, of repeating cyclical events in life. And deep down in the soul, we yearn not to be swallowed by nature, to be disintegrated in the infernal king, inferior kingdoms or the kingdoms of the abyss. Now, uh, to escape that, we need to follow the commandments of Jehovah Elohim, which is in the Bible, thou shalt not fornicate. And to willingly work to the practices we give in this tradition on ourselves so that we can ascend towards heaven through a, or a practical work. Now, this teaching was also given by the Sufi initiates, such as Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi, or simply known as Rumi in the West. And many Sufis are not even aware, or many individuals are not aware of that, that we find this even in Middle Eastern doctrine, the esoteric teachings of Islam. Rumi explained this, I died as a mineral and became a plant. I died as plant and rose to animal. I died as animal and I was man. Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? And then he elaborates that if we want to ascend towards God, we need to transcend the state of the humanoid person, the humanoid, in order to become an angel. So this path that we discussed previously is the path of revol revolution. It means that it takes a particular effort on our part in order to actualize divinity within us and to develop it. Yet once more I shall die as man or humanoid, uh, a human person to soar with angels blessed All, uh, from, with angels blessed but even from angelhood I must pass on all except God doth perish so we're interested in becoming angels and the angels are interested to coming closer to God but that's another level and, and uh, we'll take other lectures to discuss but here we're just discussing how we want to transcend this wheel 
uh, of, of uh, the wheel of uh, return, transmigration, better said. And later Rumi says, When I have sacrificed my angel's soul, I shall become what no mind ever conceived. Oh, let me not exist. For non-existence, meaning the absolute from which, from which we emerged, that great source of divinity from which the gods emerged, for non-existence proclaims in organ tones, to him we shall return, which is a, va- a very famous teaching in Islam. Now, uh, in the next graphic, we have uh, what we denominate the three aspects of Gnostic psychology, which we've been discussing uh, already. Now, uh, it's important to understand what in us returns into new bodies and what in us um, needs to be worked on and eliminated if we want to unite with divinity. The Bible talks about, uh, you could say, three principal characters which are essential to understanding, uh, we could say, this our psychology. As I've been mentioning, we have the ego, which we can call Cain in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. So from uh, what happened in the original story was that Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, meaning they abused of that sacred sexual power and did not use it for divine purposes. And therefore they were expelled. Literally the word Eden means bliss. And uh, although many theologians and uh, philosophers have argued that it was God who expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, the truth is that we expelled ourselves. And literally, there is an expulsion of energy, the expulsion of the energies of bliss, when there is an orgasm, when there is uh, the abuse of the sexual power. So, willingly, as a result of uh, following our animal passions, we continued along the path of procreation as animals, instead of using that energy to create the soul within. Now, when Adam and Eve were expelled, they uh, we have this... Uh, Excerpt from the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from Yochavah, the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, or Habel. And Habel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Adam knew his wife. This means to have, knowledge, to have knowledge of one's wife is to engage in, in the sexual act, whether as animals or as uh, angels, because the angels are born from sex in the same way that a physical body can be born from sex. The soul can also be created through that energy. And this is the teachings of Tantra. Now, uh, if we abuse of that energy, we create Cain. So these are not just people who lived in the past, but these are archetypes, symbols of uh, elements within our interior that we need to understand. So through the act of fornication, of abusing the energy, we, cr- we heavily fortified the mind, the intellect, and, gave, and strengthened animal passion. And so uh, Eve said, I have gotten a man from Yod because Yochava is a, se- is a sexual energy. The power of Christ is within, is within the sexual uh, matter. She said, I, I gave birth to Cain as a result of my energy. And she again bore his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, it's important to know that in alchemy, Adam is not just representing man within the past, but refers to the brain. Eve, or Chava, literally means mother of the living. And it refers to the sexual organs, whether in man or woman. So Adam and Eve represent aspects of our physiology and our psychology. The mind, Adam, and Eve, Chava. And uh, it is precisely through this energy uh, when Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Because it was Eve that took from that fruit from the tree. Meaning the sexual organs indulged in passion and lust and expelled that energy. Ate from the forbidden fruit. So she then gave it to Adam, to the brain, said, this, this feels wonderful, taste this, the, taste the orgasm. So the brain is the one that receives the effects afterwards and then justifies, oh, this is a, this is a good feeling. 
However, they realized that they were naked, meaning they lost their connection with their divinity and they felt the absence of God within them. This is the esoteric meaning of Genesis. And so later, uh, they, I mean, they were expelled by Jehovah Elohim, by Jehovah, Yorchava, and then Adam knew his wife again, Eve. And uh, through that energy, again, created Cain. Cain is the type of mind that we have in these times, which is solely based on the senses, is very materialistic. This is what it means to be a tiller of the ground. Only concerned with physical things, our job or money or career or family, uh, supporting ourselves physically, uh, being identified with the senses. All of us are tillers of the ground. We are occupied with physical things. And uh, we typically are not keepers of sheep. A sheep in uh, esotericism refers to uh, the Lamb of Christ. Sheep, lamb, ram, Jesus is referred to as the lamb, refers to how uh, to be a keeper of sheep is to work with that energy known as Christ. So um, those of us who enter into these type of studies, we work with mantra, and if we're married, we work on alchemy, conserving the energies in order to become keeper of sheep, to uh, develop those principles of Christ within us. And so if we remember the story, Cain killed Abel. And this refers to how our own ego, our own anger and pride and vanity and lust kills the soul. Whenever we identify with any negative element in our, in our mind or heart or body, we kill our soul. We destroy our consciousness. We deepen our suffering. We feed our consciousness and trap our soul within the cages of the ego, the mind. And so uh, it's important to understand these principles because our ego is the shell that encages our soul and prevents us from knowing God. Likewise, uh, we study these principles because it's the ego and the essence or the ego and the soul, Cain and Abel, that constantly we incorporate into new bodies. So when we ask ourselves, what is it that returns to a new humanoid body? Well, it's our ego and our, and our, and our soul constantly returning to new bodies. Whenever we enter a new body or have entered into new bodies, we develop what's called a personality. Personality pertains to uh, one's customs, language, name, heredity, culture, things that are uh, extrinsic, particularly relating to physical things. That develops typically within the years four to seven within a child. And, the, and then it is by developing a personality, which the Latin word persona means masks, how we relate to the world. That's how the ego can reincorporate. So the ego needs its uh, personality in order to manifest in the physical body, which is explained in books like uh, Treaties of Revolutionary Psychology. But in synthesis, we talk about ego in essence and personality. Now in the Bible... Personality pertains to a figure known as Nimrod. Now, Nimrod was the one who built the Tower of Babel, or we know it as the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel represents all the gibberish that we find in our planet, whether in politics, systems that, prom that state that they promote freedom and, and equality for all, but in fact are degenerate and destructive. We find this type of babble and incoherence within religions that teach that one is easily saved without having to work on oneself. This type of babble in the personality we find in uh, all the wars that have existed on this planet with our humanity. So, it, the, so the reason why, uh, or let me explain further, in the myth, Nimrod was building this tower of Babel to heaven. A god indignant confounded that humanity and humanity then separated into different languages and customs and, peop and types of people, groups. Because in the past it was stated in the Bible that humanity spoke one language. When humanity was pure, they spoke only the language of God, called the pure gold, golden language. As a result of entering into fornication, 
the mind or, or one creates anger and all these negative psychological elements, the ego. And that in turn creates division and later manifests and propagated itself within different groups and cultures where people began to experience a greater sense of separation. Different languages developed, different customs and cultures developed. That's personality. Personality is a type of energy. And it's crystallized within our body, within our psyche, or within ourselves here and now, so that we learn how to interact with the world. So either the soul or the ego can use the personality. Now, we want, we want to use our personality, our ways of dealing with the world, our customs, our job, our language, in a conscious way, using it with the soul. But uh, typically what is it, happens is that our ego complicates things, fortifies things. And therefore, the personality becomes very degenerated as well. And we really, we create our own towers of Babel. In each life that we enter into, we create new problems for ourselves. Just in a different language, maybe, in a different type of culture. A different type of existence. We have here in this, uh, this uh, the book of Genesis, uh, book, uh, chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty, mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yorchava. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yorchava. So what does it mean that Nimrod, the personality, is a mighty hunter? It means that we, uh, with our personality, we're always constantly hunting after things. People have a very, you know, comedians, politicians have very strong personalities and people feel attracted to that. Now, the personality is something that is born in one life and is disintegrated when that soul disincarnates. That soul reincorporates into a new body. The personality is something that is not mutable. It's not immutable. It's something that is transient. People who, who are very clairvoyant, who look in graveyards, they often will see the personalities of the dead, mistaking them as the soul or, or consciousness or, or ghost of that person. They see the, really the energy of that person, which is the personality. And uh, if that personality is very strong, it can even move physical things. And many people have documented this type of phenomenon. But the personality is, bo- is born in life and then it dies in the grave, basically. The personality does not, re- does not return. It's always, there's always a new building, there's always a new Tower of Babel that we create in each life, which creates problems for ourselves. And so the doctrine of return was taught by uh, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. So he explained in the, the scripture how it is the, really the ego and the, and the soul, the consciousness or essence, that reincorporates into new physical bodies. Now in these studies we, we teach that uh, we are granted 108 opportunities within humanoid bodies. In order to perform this work that we call self-realization, in order to enter the path of Tantra, in order to follow the commandments of Jehovah Elohim. So that, uh, like in the Bible, we can create Sept. So if you remember the book of Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve begot Cain and Abel. Abel was killed, and later Adam and Eve, uh, Adam knew his wife again and, be- and begot Sept. And Sept is an archetype referring to uh, working in alchemy. But it would take another lecture to explain the meaning of that. But here we're discussing how the soul and the ego reincorporate and that we have 108 opportunities within humanoid bodies. The reason being is that we have 12 zodiacal signs. We, we, we incorporate within each zodiacal sign nine times. Nine refers to, in Kabbalah, the secret teachings of alchemy or Yesod, the foundation, the sexual energy. And so, in order for us to gain experience with, it, with different types of personalities, learning about different ways of being, we are born nine times within each zodiacal sign so that we gain experience and become more rounded as a psyche. The problem is that we typically are not aware of where we came from or where we're going. And therefore, we need to learn to meditate so that we can um, comprehend where it is we came from. And Yes? Steiner said it in the own fortune. This is a map of the soul. 
there's certain there's certain tendencies that are that are manifest within certain horoscopes. I'm not gonna I don't suggest the as you know the pop horoscopes that people propagate, <laughs> but esoteric astrology, which is very profound. There's certain tendencies we can learn about the type of personality that we develop in result in relationship to the zodiacal sign of which we belong, that will guide us to certain understandings of how to relate to the world. So it can. Because the truth is, uh, if we're say, if, for instance, we're in the sign of Libra, it probably means that we've already, we've already been in that sign many times. So we have the zodiacal influences within ourselves here and now. We're just not aware of it. It just happens to be that in this current incarnation, we are manifesting a specific tendency. So it's important to understand what is that uh, chief characteristic tendency that we're manifesting through the zodiac on which we were born in this life. So it does relate to our past lives. Because we developed under different zodiacal signs. And they all relate. And we need to uh, comprehend them. Yes? Isn't it true, too, that uh, regardless of what your sun sign is in any particular life, uh, in the books they talk about uh, your ray, one of the seven, and that's the continuous thing, is that you belong to... Yes, and we talk about in these studies the seven rays, which relates to God. Here we're talking about the personality, which is transient. We, we, we develop many personalities, we discard them in each life. And uh, the spiritual ray pertains to our inner divinity within, which is eternal. So are you saying that the zodiacal sign, the zodiac sign um, influences your personality or your ego? Or it, it, it actually, it, it, it mostly it, it pertains to our personality, oh. but also... Certain egos relate to certain tendencies in the personality. Because, like, when you wear, when we wear a mask at a party, for, for instance, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you study Shakespeare, but there's a certain play where characters were dressed in masks and they're playing a role as a result of the mask that they wore. So they were exhibiting certain tendencies as a result of the performance they were doing. Persona is a mask, a personality in which how we relate to others. So it does. Uh, relate to certain egos that we have. And also there's certain positive influences in the Zodiac that pertain to the soul. Now, uh, in the book pra Practical Astrology, the soul can manifest certain uh, tendencies which are superior, relating to a Zodiac. So it's very, it relates to all of that. But for us, we want to know how it relates to our personality because our personality is very centered on our, the negative influence of our Zodiac. It's a deep, and it's a deep science, which would take many, like a whole course to explain it. But... In terms of our personality and our ego and our, and our essence, the zodiac, we were born in each zodiac, we need to study our zodiac because it's going to tell us about our personality, certain tendencies that we have. Now, uh, in each life, we return to a, zo a certain zodiac and we, uh, we're granted, as I said, 108 lives, opportunities in order to enter the path of self-realization. So, uh, the master Krishna spoke to our Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, teaching this. These bodies of the embodied self, Atman, the innermost being, who is our own father within, which is eternal, indestructible, and immeasurable, are said to have an end, meaning the bodies are, are said to have an end. Therefore, fight, O Arjuna. He who takes the self to be the slayer and he who thinks he is slain, neither of them knows. He slays nor, not, nor is he slain. So he's giving a teaching here about the need to enter the path of self-realization. Because the body will die, but the soul and ego will continue on. And if we don't develop our consciousness by working on the ego, by disintegrating it through meditation, by working with sexual energy, whether in mantras or working as a, in a matrimony, we cannot enter into that straight path mentioned by Jesus. The path of revolution of the consciousness to return to God and ascend to the higher kingdoms. So Krishna continues relating to Atman, the spirit, our inner God. He is not born, nor does he, nor does he ever die. After having been, again, he again ceases and not to be. Unborn, eternal, changeless, and ancient. He is not killed when the body is killed. Whosoever knows him to be indestructible, eternal, unborn, and inexhaustible. How can that man slay, uh, say, O oh Arjuna, how can that man slay or Arjuna or cause to be slain? Just as a man casts off worn-out clothes and puts on new ones, 
So also the embodied self casts off worn out bodies and enters others that are new. So like Rumi said, you know, why worry? In a sense, you know, people are, are, are terrified of death physically, but they ignore that they may be given the opportunity to return to a new body, depending on karma. Weapons cut it not. Fire burns it not. Water wets it not. Wind dries it not. This self, our inner being, cannot be cut, burnt, wetted, nor dried up. It is eternal, all-pervading, stable, ancient, and immovable. This self is said to be unmanifested, unthinkable, and unchangeable. Therefore, knowing this to be such, thou shouldst not grieve. But even if thou thinkest of it as being constantly born and dying, even then, O mighty armed, thou shouldst not grieve. For certain is death for the born, and certain is birth for the dead. Therefore, over the, over the inevitable, thou shouldst not grieve. Beings are unmanifested in their beginning, manifested in their middle state, O Arjuna, and unmanifested again in their end. What is there to grieve about? And as I said, Rumi mentioned the same thing. What, when was I less by dying? But he's saying, what's important, this teaching by Krishna, is that if we don't consciously work to destroy our defects, the nature will come and swallow us. Because in order to be saved in Christian soteriology and the doctrine of salvation, we need to eliminate our defects so that we can return to God. This is the path of the cross taught by Master Jesus. The other option is to allow oneself to be swallowed by nature. At the end of one's 108 humanoid bodies, if that soul has not made any effort to change, then there is no other choice but for that soul to, within the ego to be disintegrated, or the ego of that person to be disintegrated by nature. This is represented in the Divine Comedy by uh, the Inferno, where Dante, taken by his master Virgil, descend to the different inferior spheres of the klipot, the interior dimensions of the earth. So this, is, this doesn't mean that physically there are people in the earth suffering, but within the interior dimensions of nature, <clears throat> excuse me, there are different beings that suffer. And if you remember the image of the Bhava Chakra we showed, there are the hell beings who are trapped within that realm, being disintegrated by their own passion and by the forces of nature which are exerting themselves like uh, the earth, crushing coal in order to eliminate its impurities. So um, Dante here in this image is with Virgil looking at the lost souls in the ninth sphere. So there's uh, nine heavens and nine hells we say in Kabbalah. The ninth sphere, sphere we see souls that are disintegrating within the interior of the earth. They're frozen at their neck up or their bodies are lodged in place being destroyed and the forces of nature are slowly disintegrating their uh, ego we didn't mention previously but we elaborate that uh, in relation to the development of the soul within the forces of evolution upon entering the mineral kingdom the soul receives certain bodies now not only does the soul receive a physical body as a mineral but also we call internal bodies or uh, lunar bodies these are gifts of nature that allow that soul to exist within superior dimensions, known as heaven, known, which we can access in the dream state. So those souls de uh, develop within their lunar bodies, those vehicles that belong to nature, in order to progress up the different kingdoms. Those lunar bodies develop and grow and, uh, as a result of those forces. Even upon entering the humanoid kingdom, we, d we have the lunar bodies. And... Uh, the problem is that our soul manifesting in those bodies, if it does not make the effort to change, the ego really integrate the ego integrates with those lunar bodies, and nature sends it swallows her own children, as in the law to eat or be eaten. Those forces take those bodies along with the soul down into the inferior kingdoms to be disintegrated. So what we see here are the souls within their lunar bodies being disintegrated. So these are vehicles for the soul to manifest. Kronos, yes. And Saturn is Kronos, too. That's the same like, analogy you're making here? Is it a relationship? And Saturn is death. Okay. 
And uh, really, or we could say that uh, Mother Nature really s- s- tends to swallow her own children. This is the meaning of the goddess Kali in Hinduism, one, the inverted aspect of Kali, which is the one who devours her children. And even Shakespeare had a play called Titus Andronicus, in which, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, a man gets revenge on this woman, uh, uh, his enemy, by f- secretly killing her children and then feeding it to her. Symbolically hidden in that is that she represents Kali eating her own children, eating the soul. Now, um, this uh, path devol- devolving and entering into inferior states, those lunar bodies are disintegrated along with the ego by the forces of nature. Is the 108 lives like, strict? Or if someone was like really trying to change and ran out of time, are, is there like any mercy for people? The law is mercy. So, so the law of karma is mercy and severity. There's always opportunities if the soul is working. Oh. If, if they reach their 108th life and they are showing that they're demonstrating that they want to continue the path, they're going to get in another body. They're going to be helped. Oh. And also, uh, the soul is granted us extra help by creating the solar bodies too, particularly in relation with the solar astral body, which we're going to explain. Now, uh, Homer said, it is better to be a beggar upon earth than a king in the kingdom of darkness. And Salm Island Vior states the following about the, this path of transmigration in his book, The Magic of the Runes. Therefore, the descent into the tenebrous world is a backward trip through the devolving path. It is a downfall into an always increasing density with an obscurity and rigidity. It is a return, a repetition of the animal, plant, and mineral states in short, a return into the primitive chaos. And that chaos is within the interior of the earth, in the, in the inferior dimensions, in which we find precisely the souls disintegrating as in this image, where uh, the lost souls are being, uh, such as in the lake, of, uh, the lake of the ninth sphere, the frozen lake, they're being disintegrated. The souls of the abyss are liberated with the second death. These souls receive the token for their freedom when the ego and the lunar bodies are reduced to dust. The souls who are coming from the interior of the earth, who are marked by the frightful subterranean trip and covered with dust, convert themselves into gnomes of the mineral kingdom, and later into elementals of the plant kingdom, further into animals, and finally they reconquer the lost human state. So the second death mentioned in the book of Revelation pertains to when the lunar bodies and the ego are disintegrated in the ninth sphere. But... It doesn't mean that, like a religion says, there is eternal damnation, that one is in hell forever. It doesn't mean that. It refers to eternity, how eternity is a circle, and that eternity has its own sense of temporality, of time, not linear, but circular. And etern- to suffer eternal damnation means to suffer within eternity. It doesn't mean that it's punishment without end. That would be ludicrous, because divinity is merciful. So the second death is necessary to free those souls from the hell realms. So the souls can then evolve again up the, superior, the, the elemental kingdoms. This is the wise doctrine of transmigration taught in foregone times by Krishna, the Hindustani master. Millions of souls who died within the inferno are now playing as gnomes upon the rocks. Other souls are now delectable plants or are living within animal creatures and longing to return to the human state. So it should not be surprising that, or this, this teaching should not necessarily be uh, for uh, scholars of religion, something that is uh, unusual, because we find this teaching of return or reincorporation of transmigration and the descent into the inferior kingdoms explained in many cosmogonies and theologies, especially within the Aeneid by uh, Virgil, which is probably one of the most well-read documentations of uh, uh, Latin uh, literature. So in the poem, we're describing Aeneas, the Trojan paladin who uh, escapes the burning of Troy in order to found the kingdom of Italy or Latinium, Latinium, to propagate his people, represents how the soul is uh, entering to the, the superior path, performing the exodus, we can say, like Moses, ascending up back to the promised land of uh, Yorchaba, the tree of life. So uh, in the poem, Aeneas comes upon an island where when they're ripping off the branches to perform a, a, 
a ritual, to, um, a ritual ceremony for fire. One of the trees, it starts to bleed and a voice cries out from it. And so the, the soldiers and Aeneas are alarmed when they hear uh, this, uh, with this uh, proclamation from the soul within the tree. Why do you tear my for- poor flesh, Aeneas? Take pity now on the man who is buried here and not, do not pollute your righteous hands. I am not stranger to you. It was Troy that bore me and this is not a tree that is oozing blood. Escape, I beg you, from these cruel shores, from this land of greed. It is Polydorus that speaks. This is where I was struck down and an iron crop of weapons covered my body. Their sharp points have rooted and grown in my flesh. So in this image we have, again, a picture from Dante's Divine Comedy. The tree, the people who are, the souls that are trapped within the bodies of trees. And they're suffering within these forms, tormented by the harpies, which are, we say, witches or uh, sorceresses who take on the form of uh, birds with with their humanoid faces intact. And they're inflicting suffering on these souls that are devolving within the trees, within those uh, elemental forms, within hell. So Salma Island Vior states the following in The Magic of the Runes. Since the ancient times of Arcadia, when worship to the gods of the four elements of the universe and to the deities of the tender corn was still performed, the old hierophants, with their hair growing white with wisdom, never ignored the multiplicity of the I, the ego. Is it then rare, perchance, for any one of these many entities that constitute the ego to seize itself to life with such obsession and to be reborn in a tree. So the ego is not singular, but multiple. Each negative emotion is in itself an ego, a sense of self that can either reincorporate into new bodies or, but as a gift of uh, divinity, can be sent down into the infernal kingdoms to give uh, help to the the soul to which that ego belongs. So the ego is multiple. If we examine our mind, each negative type of thought or feeling or emotion is separate. It's a different type of entity. And so as taught by um, the great masters, we have uh, this understanding that uh, the ego is multiple and that as a gift of grace, not all of our egos will manifest within the same body that we have. Sometimes when reincorporating into a new humanoid body, certain egos are lost. Certainly the most perverse egos are sent down into the inferno to be disintegrated as a gift of uh, mercy. This particularly relates to uh, the myth of the centaurs. Now uh, we have in this image, I believe it's Athena or Minerva, uh, her Romanized name, uh, soothing or trying to ease the suffering of a centaur. A centaur is half human, half animal. That's really us. We are half humanoid. I mean, we have really the physical body of a human, but our mind is animal. Another meaning of the of the centaur is a being that has uh, divinity within, has created what we call the solar bodies, but still has the ego to eliminate. That's a a centaur is really like a split being. In Arabic, we call it Hasna Musin. Beings with a split polarity, one that's in God, one with development in God, but still the ego has not been fully eliminated. So Minerva is offering grace to this uh, this being. So uh, certain beings are given uh, that really, I would say all of us are given that help when we've reincorporated to a new body. Certain egos are lost, and the less perverse egos are given into our body in order for us to work on them. So, some island viewer states the following in the Magic of the Runes, uh, elaborating on the points we made. Another case comes into my memory that of Pythagoras and his friend, who is reincorporated into a poor dog. But is it not perhaps true that the centaurs are assisted? What are the legends of the centuries telling us? These epic warriors, centaurs, who fell bleeding among the helmets and bucklers of those who gloriously died for the love of their people and their country, receive a well-deserved extra help when they return into this world. It is written with tremendous words that the centaurs, before returning to this valley of tears, eliminate part of themselves, part of their beloved ego. 
The law for centaurs is as follows. What is decisively criminal in them must enter the crematorium of the infernal worlds. And what is less perverse must be reincorporated into a human body. Leo Laurel crowned Florentine Dante found many centaurs in the abyss. Let us remember Chiron, the old tutor of Achilles, and and Phallus, who was so frenzied. It is said with frightening and complete clarity in the great book of nature, written with flaming embers, that before returning into this world, many parts of the ego are lost. Many psychic aggregates of the itself reincorporate into organisms of beasts. Others are desperately seized, as the case of Polydorus, into the branches of trees. And finally, certain subjective elements of the I, the ego, the myself, continue their devolution into the submerged mineral kingdom. So uh, it's it's an act of mercy, really. So that uh, if we really had all of our egos, especially the worst ones, manifesting in our psyche in this level in which we are, we would be suffering a lot more. But in many cases, the really we're given help. And the centaurs, those initiates who developed the solar bodies or the superior vehicles of the soul have uh, received the special grace. So the lunar bodies pertain to bodies given by nature. Solar bodies are, uh, signify what is meant by Jesus to be born again. Precisely through Tantra, the path of the cross. To create spiritual vehicles that can manifest divinity within, which relates to reincarnation that we're going to explain. So in this image, we have the Wheel of Fortune, the Wheel of the Centuries, the Wheel of Karma. So everything we've been explaining pertains to uh, transmigration or return, how the soul migrates into different bodies, through the different kingdoms. Now we're going to talk about specifically the laws that relate to our current physical life pertaining to karma, which we also call recurrence, or the law of recurrence pertains to karma. In this image, we have the wheel of fortune, which can also be equated with the bhava chakra as well. And uh, in this image, we have fortune that is blind, is uh, rotating the wheel of destiny, in which the poor are elevated and the rich are dis- are denigrated, they descend. Karl Orff beautifully represented this in his Carmina Burana, great uh, initiatic work of art. It's a coral, uh, coral piece. Now, people often think that fortune is some blind law that is um, controlled or managed by some outside external being, some external entity. And that they say, well, justice is blind, God is blind and causing, is causing my suffering and is ignoring my, my pain and has no mercy. This is an ignorant perspective to take. Because the one that is blind in this image is us. The truth is we all have power over our own destiny if we take control of it. As uh, Hamlet stated in, or as Shakespeare wrote in Hamlet, to be, uh, whether to, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether to snowball in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. So either to be swallowed through nature, devolving into hell, or to revolt against that, those forces in order to unite with God, to be or not to be. So all of us are constantly receiving the results of our past actions, whether in this life or in previous lives. Recurrence pertains to the cycle or manifestation of, cycl- uh, of events that have their roots in past lives, past actions as well. Karma is Sanskrit, literally means deed, coming from the root word kri, which means to do, make, cause, and effect. The word karman means to act. refers to cause and effect, causality. It does not mean a blind law in which we suffer a lot as a result. It refers to the equilibration of forces as a result of our past actions. So if we were evil in a past life, we will receive the results of our actions from that life. If we inflicted harm on another person, that person will will come return, will come back in our life as a recurrence, and will inflict that same harm on us. This is the law of the Italian. Now, typically, we identify too much with our situations. 
the recurrent, uh, recurrent themes of our life, and we have many psychological songs in which we justify our suffering. We all have that to a degree. Now, the thing is to realize that we are the ones responsible for our own actions. And therefore, we can receive superior results if we learn to fulfill what we call karma yoga, helping others, doing good deeds, so that we can cancel out our past karma and also recurring events that are negative in nature. This law is fundamental even within Christianity and Judaism, not just uh, Hinduism or Buddhism. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 verse 7. So recurrence pertains to, um, say for instance, if we uh, committed adultery in the past, in a past life, when meeting that partner again, Karma will be an action and that individual may commit adultery against us as a result of, uh, as a type of uh, equilibration of forces. We did evil, we have to receive evil. Whatever we, whatever we do, we receive the result. Therefore, if we are not uh, in control of our own mind, as we stated in the beginning about the Dhammapada, mind precedes phenomena, we become what we think. If we don't comprehend this law in action, then we are always going to suffer as a result of our mistaken actions. Exactly. The way, what we are internally determines our life and also attracts our life. Uh, events constantly repeat themselves so long as the ego is there. The ego that was responsible for certain crimes or conflicts in our life relating to past lives is constantly fulfilling its own, uh, uh, enacting itself in accordance with its own conditioning. Now, if we let ourselves be controlled by our mind, then we receive the results. The ego is an actor, as Salma Island Vior states in Revolutionary Psychology, constantly playing the same dramas, tragedies, comedies, etc. on the screen of life. If you kill the actor, the drama is, is over. If you kill the actor, there's no more comedy. Instead, you have a superior way of life. So we need to comprehend the ego and annihilate it. So that we cease to repeat life in a, in a mistaken way. Now, the Buddha said that there are three eternal things in life that pertain to this doctrine of recurrence and uh, karma as well as cosmological teachings. There is the law, karma, which is eternal. There is nirvana, and then there is space. So these are eternal things within, within nature. The law pertains to the law of equilibrium. Scientists call it invariance, in which uh, any energy that is uh, enacted from a certain uh, point of origin must always return to that point of origin in order to balance itself. Therefore, psychologically speaking, we need to understand how this applies to us. Because if we constantly argue with our friends or family or spouse, feeding our anger, that energy that we expel outward is going to come back at us. And therefore, we have to receive the results of our actions. Now, what we need to understand is nirvana. Because nirvana in Sanskrit means cessation. Cessation pertains to the elimination of the causes of our suffering, which is heaven. Heaven is a state of being. It's also a place, uh, the superior dimensions of nature. But it more importantly refers to us here and now as a psychological state. So we need to understand cessation of the causes of our suffering is in accordance with Buddhism if we want to uh, enter a superior way of life. And then there's the space, which is the eternal root origin of our being. We call it the absolute. We call it the emptiness, shunyata. We call it Allah. We call it Christ. It's the source of all creation, of all beings. And uh, is a emptiness that is not an abstract nihilism, nor is it a complete negation of all things. Instead, it is a type of being that can only be comprehended through meditation and experience. And so, in relation to this Buddhist doctrine, uh, understanding the impermanent nature of phenomena is how we learn to comprehend our ego. Because when we see how our, our ego, physical sense of self is transient, how anger emerges in accordance with causes and conditions, and then disappears, how certain emotional states come and go, 
how they recur, how they repeat themselves. It's by comprehending this relationship to external phenomena that we comprehend that our internal states are really empty and that anger is not eternal. It's just it's a transient emotional state, a mistaken perception of self, which traps our consciousness and makes us suffer. Now, when we comprehend that it is intrinsically really em- it, it's that no ego is independent of anything else. There's nothing eternal about it. And that uh, there are certain causes and conditions, certain karma that propel and enact that ego to manifest within a certain situation. We understand that that sense of self is really empty. And by this is how we learn to comprehend the ego. Comprehending that it is, no defect is intrinsically existing of itself. There's always causes and conditions upon which it depends. So Nietzsche, uh, who was a German initiate at one point, explains this teaching in his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, precisely the concepts we've been discussing. In this image, we have the fictional, or we have uh, the Iranian prophet Zarathustra, founder of Zoroastrianism, holding in his right hand the staff of the initiates with a golden orb and a serpent uh, rotating around it. That serpent is the power of the Divine Mother. And the staff represents the spinal column upon which the Kundalini rises in the teachings of alchemy as we teach. What's interesting is that in his, with his left hand, he's performing in Buddhism what's known as the Vitarka Mudra. And Nietzsche is very famous for postulating in his book the doctrine of the eternal return, which we're going to be explaining. Now, uh, in Buddhism, this mudra, hand posture, is supposed to represent the transmission of a teaching from the Buddha, or from any Buddha, really. Now, what's interesting is that we have a circle formed by our index finger and our thumb, which relates to the cycle of recurrence or return. And then we have the three fingers representing the three primary forces of nature, the power of Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or in Kabbalah, Keter, Chokmah, Bina. The Trinity is the light of God that manifests from the Absolute. And it is through this Trinity that we learn to create a spiritual life. So these are not people, but anthropomorphic figures, but energies. And so, in order to overcome the wheel of samsara, or the wheel of becoming, the eternal return in the circle, we need to work with the three primary forces, which is what we do when we practice alchemy. Man and woman united, masculine, feminine, affirmative force, negative force, and then the sexual act, reconciliation, the synthesis, are the three forces in action. That is how we create spiritually. And so, Nietzsche talks about this very beautifully in his book, particularly in this section called Upon the Blessed Isles. Creation. That is the great redemption from suffering and life's growing light. But that the Creator may be. Suffering is needed and much change. Indeed, there must be much bitter dying in your life, you Creators. Thus are you advocates and justifiers of all impermanence. So creation is a redemption from suffering, meaning to create the soul. Precisely through alchemy, in the higher stages of the path. It is also life's growing light. We generate light precisely by working with our sexual energy to create spiritually. But in order for the Creator to be, we need to suffer, meaning we need to willingly take on and be responsible for our, our own suffering, the causes of our own afflictions to take responsibility for what we did in the past in order to recognize our faults. So karma comes back at us for past actions, whether in this life or previous lives. And we learn to take it with a sense of rectitude. Instead of complaining about it, we use it to see those egos that manifest within a given psychological circumstance so that we can die in those defects. So, indeed, there must be much bitter dying in your life. He didn't say that the path of salvation is easy. Instead, we need to suffer a lot so that ego emerges and that's causing our suffering. Comprehend it in meditation so that we can annihilate it. So, thus are you advocates and justifiers of all impermanence. So the doctrine of impermanence, same thing that Nietzsche is teaching here, is uh, 
how nothing is stable in this universe. Everything is dependent on something else. And that uh, it is by recognizing the empty nature of phenomena that we cease to be so attached to external phenomena so that our ego has less power over us. And it's in that way, by comprehending the ego, though, it, we annihilate it gradually. To be the child who is newly born, the creator must also want to be the mother who gives birth in the pangs of the birth giver. Verily, through a hundred souls I have pa- already passed on my way, and through a hundred cradles and birth pangs. Some people say that Nietzsche was an atheist at one point, or mistaken. And this is really teaching that, well, he's been in many bodies. I've been through many cradles and birth pangs. Many a farewell have I taken. I know the heart-rending last hours. Because, you know, he was, he, at, the, at one point, before he deviated, he was developing a lot of understanding in himself. And so he remembered his past lives and was explaining these teachings about the return of all things. But thus my creative will, my destiny wills it. Or to say it more honestly, this very destiny, my will, wills. So what does this mean, my creative will? So creation pertains to the Trinity above. So in the Kabbalah, if you look in this diagram, we have uh, ten spheres, ten sephiroth. Above is the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the middle, at the center of the Tree of Life, we have... uh, Known as the seer, known as Tifereth, which is willpower. So creative will pertains to how Christ manifests within the soul, within the heart. Because if we take this image and transpose it on a human being, the middle sephira or sphere relates to the heart, Tifereth. So creative will, and he's speaking Kabbalistically, is how the Trinity, the will to create, manifests within the soul, within the human psyche. This is important to understand in relation to his teaching. Thus my creative will, my destiny wills it. The fact that he uh, is entering this path. Or to say it more honestly, this very destiny, my will, wills. Most of us talk about destiny as it's some kind of outside thing that's influencing us. Few people have really exemplified how with their own willpower they can change their destiny. So karma is not a blind law. It can be overcome. It can be reconciled. If we are working in the right way. In sexual knowledge, sexual alchemy. But it's also mantra would originate here? Sound the word is gestated from the throat. Right. So in alchemy, when we combine, when we sexually unite with our partner, we pronounce sacred mantras. And yes, our own yesod, our own tree of knowledge, whether a man and woman are united, forming the cross. Yesod, the energy of God, ascends up the spinal medulla, as we find in this staff of uh, Zarathustra. And the serpent is ascending as a result of working with those fires. So with mantra, we work with our willpower and our heart, following the creative will of God, the Trinity above, in order to create spiritually. So that's a Kabbalistic relationship to the body. And so it is working in this way that we overcome our destiny, our karma. We pay our karma with good deeds. And by dying in those egos that are responsible for our mistaken actions. Whatever in me has feeling, suffers and is in prison. But my will always comes to me as my liberator and joy bringer. Willing liberates. That is the true teaching of will in liberty. Thus Zarathustra teaches it. So how do we overcome our suffering? With our willpower, we take arms against the sea of troubles. Meaning we fight against our ego. So we cease to be cyclically recurring and uh, reenacting all those tragedies, dramas, and comedies of the past. We try to initiate a new way of life. Not living life mechanically, but transcending that wheel of suffering. Willing no more and esteeming no more and creating no more. Oh, that this great weariness might always remain far from me. In knowledge too, in da'at, in gnosis, I feel only my will's joy in begetting and becoming. And if there is innocence in my knowledge, it is because the will to beget is in it. So what does it mean in knowledge 
Two, I feel only my will's joy in creating. Meaning in alchemy, in tantra, in the sexual act, using it for purity, using it for God. One uh, feels only the joy of creating the soul. And uh, if there is innocence in my knowledge, meaning if there's innocence in dot, if there's innocence in me working in alchemy, meaning to perform the sexual act without lust, it is because of my joy of begetting and becoming. So the way of becoming, you know, becoming is bhava, as we mentioned in the bhava chakra. There's a way of becoming within a mechanical means, but we can also become something spiritual by transcending that wheel. And so Nietzsche says something also very interesting and controversial, like many things. Away from God and gods, this will has lured me. What could one create if gods existed? In us, God is not active. God is not manifested in our bodies. The God is not incarnated, or better said, reincarnated. Instead, we have to create God within us. We have to create the development of the soul so that God can be creating through us. What, then, how, that, how do you reconcile that with, I believe someone said, perhaps you said, we are all, since we're part of God, we're, we're sparks of the divine flame. Yes. The spark is still there. Yes. That's the spark, but it's not the bonfire. So that spark can create, be, can be fed and develop into a bonfire. That bonfire is the Lord, the, the Christ. And so what could, what, how could one create a God if the God existed already? He said, if you want to create a higher level of being, you need to develop that spark so that it becomes a giant flame. So either you nurture it or if you go into sin or you destroy it, then that, it becomes disintegrated? And then that, fa- that fire is extinguished in hell. So we need to transcend uh, this wheel of suffering. And in this next graphic, we are going to talk about the solar bodies. So in this image, we have an angel or malakim. Malakim in Hebrew means angels. Or malek is a king. So a king of nature is one who has conquered the animal state, the mineral state, the plant state, and even the humanoid state. And so what we are interested in these studies is to overcome our defects and the recurring cycles of life that we suffer mechanically as a result so that we can transcend those karmic situations and reconcile our past. And in that way, we can initiate a new way of being. That could be tricky too, I think, in a way. You have to analyze, you have to find your defects, but most of us, in one form or another, we have certain desires. But you gotta, then you have to qualify it perhaps as being not a good desire. You know, where do you, there's a line right well, I and, it, and, it's la- and it's language. Desire, we say, is typically ego. But longing is the soul. Longing belongs to Habel, Abel, who follows the will, way of God. Cain is the desire of the mind to till the earth and to fulfill material things. But in a poetic sense, we could say the soul has desire for God, like the Sufis teach. Now, uh, we want to transcend our uh, karma and enter into the path of what we call epigenesis. The ability to originate new circumstances. Because as Gurdjieff taught us, man does not know how to do. Instead, we just repeat actions from the past. We don't do anything new. We're like a train that is on a train track going one direction. But with effort, we can divert that. And it's precisely by developing conscious will Tifereth, in harmony with Christ, the Trinity, is how we become and we get, like Nietzsche says. So we're going to talk about the solar bodies, which I mentioned to you as the vehicles by which God can manifest and express. And these uh, pertain to the tree of life in Kabbalah, pertain to what we call the astral body, the solar astral body, the solar mental body, the solar causal body, or solar emotional body that can manifest superior emotions of God. Solar mental body that can manifest the abstract concepts and understanding of Christ. And the solar causal body, which is a body that can express the will of God. That can originate new causes. Salma Island Vior states the following in Cosmic Teachings of a Lama. It is clear, obvious, and manifested that the clairvoyance from some pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occultist systems also become lamentably mistaken about this body, the causal body or body of conscious will. This is due to the fact that they confuse the essence with the causal body. 
So the essence is the soul, but the causal body is the means by which the soul can act. Don't mistake the person for the car. In synthesis. The essence in itself is just a fraction of the human soul that is incarnated within ourselves. This essence is bottled up within the ego. It is engulfed within the lunar bodies. It is unquestionable that the human oculi, mistakenly called human being, is submitted to the law of recurrence. He is not capable of originating anything new. He is a victim of circumstances. And it's enough to really analyze our life to see if this is true. I mean, do we have control over whether we're going to get yelled at or someone on the street's going to honk at us and we're going to get upset? Or simple daily things that we think we have control of, but we don't. Each time that the ego returns into this valley of samsara, it repeats exactly all the acts of its previous lives. Sometimes in elevated spirals, and sometimes in lower spirals. In this day and age, within the deep pseudo-occultism, and much is spoken about the law of epigenesis, the capacity for originating new circumstances. So this is what Nietzsche talks about as creative will, to create something new within oneself. It is obvious that only the authentic human beings with conscious will can modify their destiny and originate a new order of things. The intellectual animal has not built the body of conscious will, the causal vehicle. The wretched rational homunculi, homunculi is always a victim of the eternal laws of return and recurrence. We need to create this causal body if we sincerely want to incarnate the being, God within. Only the being is capable of doing. He can modify the circumstances and exercise with mastery the law of epigenesis. So we state that in order to escape the, we could say the limitation of 108 lifetimes or humanoid existences, we can create the solar astral body in a, in a marriage, in alchemy, so that we are su submitted to superior laws. And therefore, we're not necessarily limited to having 108 existences to do this work. Instead, we, are, we transcend that law. But in order to incarnate God, we need to create the solar bodies, the causal bodies specifically. And this is beautifully represented in the life of Jesus. As you see in this next image, we have John the Baptist baptizing the Master Jesus, the Christ. So, uh, really, reincarnation now, and we can say in context in this lecture, pertains to when God manifests in the soul, to incarnate. Doesn't mean uh, entering into new bodies. That's return and recurrence. But reincarnation is an act of will, an act of creation, in which God decidedly decides to perform a mission within a certain human being and enters into that soul that has created those bodies. Think of the solar bodies as a type of electric circuitry that can manifest a high voltage. If you have poor wiring and you send a tremendous volt of, of energy to that circuitry, it'll, it'll fuse, it'll break. Christ is an energy and can only manifest in, a, in the circuitry of a human being that has those vehicles. Because if the being were to try to enter into a person with just lunar bodies, with a lot of ego involved in that, that human being would be annihilated instantly. Because Christ is the energy of life, the cosmos. So in order to reincarnate the being, we need to work in initiation. We need to work in sexual alchemy, which we describe, uh, is described in the perfect matrimony in the mystery of the golden blossom. So the Samael and Vior states the following in the, the mystery of the golden blossom. Reincarnation is a feat accomplished only by the great illuminated souls in which they consciously choose to be born in a particular time and place. In other words, they choose to incarnate the being in a new physical body. Only beings with conscious development can do this. The word reincarnation is most demanding. It must not be used carelessly. No one would be able to reincarnate without first having eliminated the ego, without truly possessing sacred individuality. Incarnation is a very venerable term, venerable word, signifying, in fact, the re-embodiment of the divine in a man. And we find this scripturally stated in the book of Matthew. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then it's the uh, book of John, 
uh, chapter 1, verse 14. The following is chapter 3 of Matthew, verses 16 to 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The waters refer to the sexual waters in which the Holy Spirit can baptize. The energy of God. So the incarnation of Jesus, is the Christ within Jesus is a, an act of reincarnation. But also many masters have incarnated the Christ. doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus was the only one. Because in fact, Muhammad received Al-Quran upon Mount Jabal Nur in the Muslim tradition. He received the teachings from Gabriel, meaning he incarnated his inner law, his inner Quran from the angel Gabriel. When Gabriel relates to procreation, the forces of the moon, the sexual energy. But uh, Krishna also incarnated within Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. What about Buddha? Buddha is a great master who incarnated Christ. All the uh, Zarathustra, many masters, they incarnated that fire because they entered in, into initiation and developed those bodies. Here we have the Bhagavad Gita where Arj- Arjuna, who represents the solar causal body, is speaking, or the soul within the solar causal body, speaking to the Christ. Krishna. And there's a couple more things we'll explain in relation to uh, the nature of these paths as we discussed in accordance with Hinduism. So I would like to give you two phrases first, specifically explaining two paths as we've been mentioning. Krishna stated the following to Arjuna. The being is not born or the self is not born. Does not die does not, nor does it reincarnate. It has no origin. It is eternal and changeless. It is the first of all and does not die when the body passes away. Now this would seem to contradict the following statement. As one sets aside worn out clothes and puts on new ones, so the embodied being, self, leaves its spent body and enters other new ones. Now what's interesting is that uh, they seem to contradict. The being doesn't incarnate, but it does incarnate with certain beings. What's not explicitly stated in the Bhagavad Gita, or uh, at least uh, clearly, exoterically, is how when one follows a path of initiation, one incarnates the being. But in lunar people, people with lunar bodies, they do not incarnate the being. So those two paths are open there. The solar path is setting up the path of revolution to God, or the lunar path to being swallowed by nature. Now, actually, the Bhagavad Gita does explain this, but... uh, elaborates upon this point. Upon leaving the body, taking the path of the fire, of the light, of the day, of the luminous lunar fortnight, and of the northern solstice, those who know Brahma, the Father, our inner God, go towards Brahma. Upon death, the yogi who takes the path of smoke and of the dark lunar fortnight, and of the southern solstice, reaches the lunar sphere, the astral world, we can say and is then reborn, returns, and re-embodies. These two paths, the luminous and the dark, are considered permanent. Throughout the first, one is emancipated, and through the second, one is reborn, or returns. So, in the solar path, we incarnate God, but in the lunar path, we continue to rotate within samsara, in synthesis. Now, those who uh, are not uh, familiar with reincarnation, should study the Bhagavad Gita. Specifically, I'd like to quote for you uh, what reincarnation really means. As according to the Hindu gospel, we could say, the Supreme Personality of God, which is Vishnu, or, 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 or Krishna through speaking to Arjuna, said, many, many incarnations both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot O subduer of the enemy, meaning the subduer of his own egos. Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, and although I am the Lord of all sentient beings, I incarnate dominating my prakriti, which relates to the Divine Mother's space, and appear in my original transcendental form, serving myself of my own maya, my own essence. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, 
O descendant of Bharata, warrior, the spiritual warrior, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself to deliver the pious and the, to annihilate the miscreants as well as to reestablish the principles of religion. I, I uh, advent myself millennium after millennium. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in the, this material world, but attains my external abode, O Arjuna. So Christ only incarnates within an initiate. Reincarnation occurs only within the gods. People, we common human, human persons, human beings, we could say out of terms of polite and respect, we just return. We don't reincarnate. We don't remember where we came from or where we're going. We have lunar, bodies. We have lunar vehicles and we are subjected to the laws of nature. But we need to uh, develop the solar bodies so that we can uh, transcend this wheel of uh, suffering. But those who incarnate God are not recognized by God, we can say. Those who incarnate the Christ, people don't, under, people don't see the Christ, even though many times we may have walked past such a being. For it states in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, when the Lord, the being, acquires a body or leaves it, he associates with the six senses or abandons them and passes like the breeze which carries with it the scent of flowers, directing the ears, the eyes, the organs of touch, taste and smell, as well as the mind. He experiences the object of the senses. The deluded do not see him who departs, stays and enjoys, but they who possess the eye of knowledge, gnosis, that. Only they behold him. So, um, we need to incarnate the being if we want to be liberated from suffering. If we want to attain a higher state of, being, a higher state of perception. So we've been explaining uh, what reincarnation means in context of return and recurrence. And uh, citing the Pythagorean teachings as well as um, the Muslim teachings of Rumi and a little bit of Nietzsche. And I, I'd actually like to conclude with, a, with a, the teachings of the eternal return as given by Nietzsche. I think it's uh, especially relevant to this discussion since we just uh, mentioned the teachings of uh, the Hindustani master Krishna. So the very same things that the German philosopher Nietzsche talked about are in the Bhagavad Gita, or taught by Pythagoras, or taught in Buddhist doctrine. And uh, the points that he makes are very poetic and beautiful, and I think that they'll be very beneficial for you to, to hear. So I'm going to read for you exactly what Nietzsche taught in his book about the eternal return. Accompanied with an exegesis, of course. So in this chapter, this is called, uh, I'm not going to read the entirety, it's called On the Vision and the Riddle, where the fictional Zarathustra, the Iranian prophet, is speaking to a group of sailors about the, a vision that he had, meaning an astral experience. Not long ago, I walked gloomily through the de deadly pallor of dusk, gloomy and hard, with lips pressed together. Not only one sun had set for me, a path that ascended defiantly through stones, malicious, lonely, not cheered by herb or shrub, a mountain path crunched under the defiance of my foot. Now, a mountain in esotericism refers to initiation, to ascend up the mountain, the path that leads to God. So, it's only attempted by those who are defiant, meaning his step is crushing the stones defiantly in order to go up, seemingly against the forces of gravity. Striding silently over the mocking clatter of pebbles, crushing the rock that made it slip, my foot forced its way upward, upward, defying the spirit that drew it downward toward the abyss, the spirit of gravity, my devil and arch enemy. Upward, although he sat on me, half dwarf, half mole, lame, making lame, dripping lead into my ear, Leaden thoughts into my brain. This is the ego telling us that we can't enter into initiations, always telling us things. He says, Oh, Zarathustra, he whispered mockingly, syllable by syllable, you philosopher's stone. You threw yourself up high, but every stone that is thrown must fall. So what is he talking about the philosopher's stone? 
So the stone relates to alchemy, the secret of Yesod, the foundation stone of Solomon's temple, which is the sexual energy. Our body is a temple, and the stone is our sexual energy. So this is talking about how, like many initiates, he tried to throw his stone up, to take that stone up the mountain, to ascend, to return it to God, so that he can finally unite with the being, the Superman. But the ego is always there saying, you threw your stone up high, you can't follow this path, you're going to drop your stone like Sisyphus, meaning you're going to let yourself fall sexually, fall to animal passion and desire. O Zarathustra, you philosopher's stone, you sling stone, you star crusher, you threw yourself up so high, but every stone that is thrown must fall. Sentence to yourself and to your own stoning. O Zarathustra, far indeed have you thrown the stole, stone, but it will fall back on yourself. Then the dwarf fell silent, and that lasted a long time. His silence, however, oppressed me. In such twosomeness is more lonesome than being alone. So being alone with our own negative mind, thoughts, is really more lonely than being, uh, being alone, we could say, being with other people. I climbed, I climbed, I dreamed, I thought, but everything oppressed me. I was like one sick whom his wicked torture makes weary and who, he, as he falls asleep, is awakened by a still more wicked dream. But there is something in me that I call courage, that has far, so far slain my every discouragement. This courage finally bade me stand still and speak. Dwarf, it is you or I. But I am the stronger of us two. You do not know my abysmal thought. That you could not bear. So what does it mean, abysmal thought? It means the fact that he wants to descend into his own hell in order to take the stone up the mountain. Because our soul is trapped in hell. We need to liberate it through our creative will. Then something happened that made me lighter. For the dwarf jumped from my shoulder, being curious, and he crouched on a stone before me. But there was a gateway just where we had stopped. Behold this gateway, dwarf, I continued. It has two faces. Two paths meet here. No one has yet followed either to its end. This long lane stretches back for an eternity. And the long lane out there, that is another eternity. They contradict each other, these two paths. They offend each other face to face. And it is here at this gateway that they come together. The name of the gateway is inscribed above, Moment. But whoever would follow one of them, and on and on, farther and farther, do you believe, dwarf, that these paths can contradict each other eternally. So, uh, Krishna said there are two paths. The solar path that leads to Brahma and the lunar path that leads down, backward. So these are the two paths that Nietzsche is talking about. And that eternally they go on. Really, that this, this constant uh, drama of souls within the universe is always repeated. It's eternal. Isn't he using the force of Tiferesto to carry Mars? Yes, and that's will, that, yeah. willpower. Zarathustra is the willpower. And he's, he's, he says, my courage is what conquers. My creative will, my destiny wills it. So the dwarf says, all that is straight lies. The dwarf murmured contemptuously, all truth is crooked. Time itself is a circle. Or better said, our illusions of linear time is illusory. Time itself is a circle. Eternity is a circle. Nothing goes on from one trajectory to another. It's really a cycle, cyclical. You spirit of gravity, I said, do not make things too easy for yourself, or I shall let you crouch where you are crouching, lame foot. And it was I that carried you to this height. Behold, I continued, this moment, from this gateway, moment, a long eternal lane leads backward. Behind us lies an eternity. Must not whatever can walk have walked in this lane before? Must not whatever can happen have happened, have been done before, have passed by before? And if everything has been there before, what do you think, dwarf, of this moment? Are not all things knotted together so firmly? Uh, it says, uh, must not this gateway to have been there before? And are not all things knotted together so firmly that this moment draws after it all that is to come? Therefore, itself too. For whatever can walk in this long lane out there too, it must walk once more. So this is referencing to the fact that many individuals have walked the path of initiation before, but they fell. And they're trying to rise up again. 
They've walked this path many times before. It happens. And this slow spider, which crawls in the moonlight, and this moonlight itself, and I and you in the gateway, whispering together, whispering of eternal things. Must not all of us have been there before? And return and walk in that other lane out there, before us in this long, dreadful lane? Excuse me. Must not we eternally return? So if we're, in this, if we're in this type of classroom, it means that we've probably studied the science before. I remember having an experience with my innermost in the astral plane where he told me 97% of the people you meet, you knew them before. This is because 97% of our psyche is ego, according to Salma Island Vior. So this is something I verified. Thus I spoke more and more softly, for I was afraid of my own thoughts and the thoughts behind my thoughts. Then suddenly I heard a dog howl nearby. Had I ever heard a dog howl like this? My thoughts raced back. Yes, when I was a child in the most distant childhood, then I heard a dog howl like this. And I saw him too, bristling, his head up, trembling, in the stillest midnight when even dogs believe in ghosts. And I took pity. For just then the full moon, silent as death, passed over the house. Just then it stood still, a round glow still on the flat roof, as if on another's property. That was why the dog was terrified, for dogs believe in thieves and ghosts. And when I heard such howling again, I took pity again. So what is the moon referencing? The lunar path, the path of devolution, the path of the destruction of the soul within hell. So it haunts us, and those who are really seeking to know God and to ascend up the path to Christ, we suffer. Because the moon is always haunting us. Where was the dwarf gone now? And the gateway and the spider and all the whispering. Was I dreaming then? Was I waking up? Was I experiencing these things directly in meditation? Among wild cliffs I stood suddenly alone. Bleak. In the bleakest moonlight. But there lay a man. And there the dog jumping, bristling, whining. Now he saw me coming. Then he hauled again. He cried. Had I ever heard a dog cry like this for help? And verily what I saw, I had never seen the like. A young shepherd I saw, writhing, gagging in spasms, his face distorted, and a heavy black snake hung out of his mouth. Had I ever seen so much nausea and pale dread on one face? He seemed to have been asleep when the snake crawled into his throat and there bit itself fast. My hand tore at the snake and tore in vain. It did not tear the snake out of his throat. What is this snake? That's afflicting the shepherd, the initiate, is the devolving serpent of hell that is our own sexual animal passion, which pushes us to fornicate, to be like animals. Then I cried out, then it cried out to me, bite, bite its head off, bite, thus it cried out of me, my dread, my hatred, my nausea, my pity, all that is good and wicked in me cried out of me with a single cry. And then he says, Arthur, you're speaking to the sailors, you bold ones who surround me, you searchers. Researchers, and whoever among you has embarked with cunning sails on unexplored seas, you who are glad of riddles, guess me this riddle that I saw then, Inter- interpret me the vision of the loneliness, the loneliest, for it was a vision and a foreseeing. What did I see then in a parable, in an astral experience, he could say? And who is it who must yet come one day? Who is the shepherd into whose throat the snake crawled thus? Who is the man into whose throat all that is heaviest and blackest will crawl thus? So it was that shepherd, Christ. Nietzsche didn't use the term Christ. He, t- he talks about Superman. So a Superman is an individual who's fully perfected God within, manifesting the three Sephiroth above, Ketera, Chokmah, Bina, within the heart, the human soul. A shepherd, like the keeper of sheep, pertains to the one who's walking the path of initiation. But this is the Superman who takes on our own evil to annihilate it. That's evil. Habel relates to that, but this is even beyond Habel. This is Christ. The shepherd, however, bit as my cry counseled him. He bit with a good bite, meaning with the mouth or with the throat, the science of Da'at, we kill the snake that is leading us into hell. We conquer that animal passion. Far away, he spewed the head of the snake and he jumped up. No longer shepherd, no longer human, one changed. Radiant, 
laughing. Never yet on earth has a human being laughed as he laughed. Oh, my brothers, I heard a laughter that was no human laughter, meaning because it was a superhuman laughter, the God, terribly divine, beyond good and evil. And now a thirst gnaws at me, a longing that never grows still. My longing for this laughter gnaws at me. Oh, how do I bear to go on living? And yet, how could I bear to die now? Thus spoke Zarathustra. So he's talking about how Christ really incarnates in the human being to, to fully eliminate the ego. That's with the path of reincarnation. The symbolism was really something else. I would wonder what Carl Jung, I don't think he ever mentioned he went, and he was very much into symbolism, subconscious mind. I wonder if he, that scenario, so to speak, that sacred scenario you just were talking about, I wonder if Jung made any... Many, well, I'm not sure about, I don't know too much about Jung, but I know that many of the German initiates knew each other. Rudolf Steiner was the disciple of Nietzsche. Nietzsche was the disciple of Richard Wagner, who was a great master. So they were all interrelated, they all knew each other. And they taught the doctrine of the Superman. So in conclusion, uh, the, uh, we seek to escape the laws of return and recurrence by developing our will in, a, in, in harmony with Christ. So we can kill the snake that tempts us into sin, which is our own uh, inverted sexual fires, which we need to tame like Moses did or we need to work with the positive serpent. The cross, as uh, mentioned in Exodus, of raise, uh, the, the bronze serpent that healed the Israelites in the wilderness. You, you just, that was the negative serpent. Doctor. The negative serpent that the shepherd bit was, in, that, was the negative, that was the inverted aspect. The serpent that tempted Adam and Eve. It's interesting. It's like the sign from when I read it. It's Scorpio. They talk about the, the, the eagle, which is noble and uh, it's sacred. And then the serpent, the, they refer to the serpent as the negative one. Go either way. Yeah, it's dual. Like the serpent kundalini that Moses raised on the staff in the wilderness. The cross of man and woman, or the bronze serpent. The two metals of copper representing woman, and tin representing man. Sexually united, create, and when that serpent is controlled, the energy is harnessed. The bronze serpent rises up the spine and it can heal the Israelites. So the serpent that Nietzsche talks about was in that negative aspect. But in the beginning and, and many times in that, in that book, he mentions the positive serpent that works with the eagle. The eagle, the serpent that rises up the spinal column, the kundalini, and the serpent, the eagle's wings that flourish and take one up to the absolute. So the bronze serpent, otherwise known as, I guess, or he calls it the husband, uh, is saying that right? Moses is to heal the Israel. Yes, the, the, exactly. The, the other serpents, like, thank you for bringing that up, because the serp- there were fiery serpents that were biting the Israelites and causing them pain. Those fiery serpents are the, all of our animal passions that afflict us. Anger, pride, vanity, as we've been mentioning. The ego, the inverted fire. And so the only way to heal that uh, ailment is to work with the solar serpent, the bronze serpent, in order to heal the Israelites. The Israelites are not just in the Bible, don't refer to people in the past in the Middle East. It refers to archetypes, symbols, parts of us that we need to liberate and free. So uh, the same serpents that were biting the Israelites was biting the Superman, but the Superman just bit it up, spat it out, and laughed. And that's only something a God can do. And we, need, we all have God within, we need to reincarnate within us. So in order to escape the return and recurrence of all things. We need questions. Um, just a, a kind of uh, epigenesis, the ability to change ourselves. Um, it, it can be correlated to physicality too. You know, in the medical community, there's compelling evidence that through, as one example, physical activity versus drug agents, we can change our genetic expression. Yes. And if someone has a formation towards some disease, that can be halted. Yes. And now, this was always possible, but as I, you know, listening actively and, and stuff, um, I think, you know, Jesus and Moses could have had smartphones, but they were just not at that point in time where, you know, this was known, or, you know, the laws were not exacted in such a way, or realized in such a way, that they could have had smartphones. You know, it was just possible. But they had much better communication than our smartphones. <laughs> 
I mean, being being if you made a if you made a Superman like that in the Eternal Planes, really they are incomprehensible to us. But uh, it's true that you know genetically, you know our actions will can affect our genes, and our genes are the inheritors of karma. So, the very physical body that we have, our tendencies, our habits, our illnesses that recur cyclically, are in our genes, and those genes are formulated as a result of our karma, our past actions, and uh, we want to. Uh, perform positive action in order to rectify that. So that's a good point because, you know, it is by changing ourselves psychologically that we change our genes. And we have many practices in this tradition where uh, we work with energy, like alchemy, in which the genes change. So the genes of an intellectual animal, like what is what we are, we can change it into the genes of a superman or superwoman, basically. I have reflected a little bit on what you... Uh, <clears throat> reiterate what Paul said in, in regards to time and, and uh, evolution of technology and things like that. The real technology is what Paul's talking about is the regeneration and development of faculties because if you actually looked at like pay attention to the Old Testament the New Testament where it's talking about the life of Jesus he's going around telepathically understanding what people are thinking saying, I saw you over there in the bushes with that woman, and, you know, you're not going to stone her to death today, and that, that sort of thing. Communication, so, like something like cell phones, would be completely irrelevant. It would be obsolete, because if someone had developed the kind of faculties that Jesus had, you wouldn't need something like that. So time frame, and, you know, time is irrelevant. It's something that you know, ancient history had better technology than we did. We just don't understand that fully yet. And uh, I remember one of their instructor mentioned, uh, we have a technology better than Google inside. And that's meditation. You can investigate anything you need to. Um, going back to what you were saying about, uh, like, if a, the karma, like, um, if a couple, the woman had been an adulterer, then in the next life, that same couple, the man would do the same thing? Yes. I'm just so confused by, like, what, and I kind of already talked to you about this, but, like, what in the person who was the victim the first time, what, like, in the next life makes them know that they should do that, and then are they following God's will by doing that? It's not God's will. It's, it's just it's our own self-will. The one that commits adultery and decides to do that is ego. But typically, the ego in a person, or typically, in our case, we're compelled by so many egos and forces that we have no cognizance of the fact. We don't see how we are just performing the same dramas, comedies, tragedies that we've been doing for many lifetimes. Okay. It's not God's will. God doesn't say, okay, now you've got to commit adultery to the other person. This is a superior law. In fact, if that person, if, if, this, if the couple's Gnostic, uh -huh. knows this is science and is working, when those egos emerge that are of an adulterous nature, mm -hmm. and that will happen with every couple, where certain karmic recurrences uh, happen, where partners from a past life come to one's forefront in order to test us and tempt us. The law is tempting, uh, testing us to say, okay, do you want to follow the superior path or the inferior path? Okay. If, if we give in to our adulter adulterous ego and we commit adultery, well, then we fail. But the couple that's working, Gnostically speaking, takes advantage of those circumstances in order to gain comprehension. And then, the love, and then those egos are annihilated and there's greater love in the couple. It's an, it's an ordeal that Samuel and Vera calls the Dairene ordeal in the book The Three Mountains. Well, because you said that um, it has to that to reach equilibrium so say a Gnostic couple experiences that and that could happen in a past life and then the woman transcends it and does not act on that ego yes are things like out of balance? think no 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 things are reconciled um, now as, in terms of balance it's like if you uh, there's an inferior way you could say if you try to relate to like physics if you punch a punching bag it's gonna move and then it's gonna come back at you mm -hmm. so that force has to come back now whether we decide to continue punching and flailing at it uh, that's the problem. Now, if you just punch it once and then the force comes back to you, you grab it, hold it still because you comprehend that, well, you're too tired. You don't, try to think, can't really extrapolate too much in the analogy, but you realize that you can't continue feeding those egos. Mm -hmm. And so when you comprehend that, you stop propelling that karma. Because if you did punch it again, then it would have to come back. And it's going to come back and it's just going to keep... Ex over over. Exactly, it's going to repeat. Yeah, it's going to... 
Yeah, and then to do that is just to suffer and continue along that cycle of samsara. You mentioned at the beginning of the lecture uh, a little bit about how, as you said it, um, teachings on return, recurrence, re reincarnation, sort of the whole subject matter here, is taken out somewhat of maybe not so much Western thinking, but Christianity. Um, if there are any examples of that you could elaborate or allude to, uh, the only thing that I can think of offhand is years ago when I read the Old Testament and the book of Job in particular, and other scant places in the Old and New Testament, but particularly the book of Job, certain passages led me to sort of see the possibility that uh, Job or the, the ones he was associating with had a notion of God putting men in. Uh, yeah, that relates to recurrence. Now, I'm speaking specific, specifically about the doctrine of transmigration. Okay. The soul entering into different bodies. Now, we have remnants of that in the Christian doctrine, where Lazarus, or the, the man who was possessed by many devils, those were taken and then placed into the, soul, placed into the bodies of pigs. That refers exactly to what I was referring to in relation to how when we reincorporate into a new body, certain egos that are definitively criminal have to be taken out of us and put into different bodies, like trees, animals, plants, cats, or dogs, or different beasts. And to enter into devolution as a type of mercy, and the one who does that is Christ. I, I never, I rarely think of it in that context because we think of casting out of demons and you know going somewhere else. And on another level, that's like talking. That's on one psycho, yeah, on one psychological level, it pertains to how we need to clean our temple. On another hand, it also talks about how certain psychological elements can reincorporate into animals. So it's in the Bible, but people don't, under, people don't really read deeply into it. Now, Christianity, we find that uh, a lot of things were taken out of the Bible, like um, Mary Magdalene's role with Jesus as his wife, things of that nature, that he practiced alchemy with her. Not long ago, I, I was studying some of that with my father on how they were... So uh, the, the, yeah, the Bible, was, a lot of things were edited and taken out. But it, you find it more common, the doctrine of return and transmigration, you find a lot in... Buddhism and Hinduism, but I, I wanted to point out how Pythagoras, uh, how uh, even Nietzsche talked about the same thing. But many scholars of Nietzsche say, no, he, he didn't talk about reincarnation or, or reincorporation. But when you know esotericism, it's very clear. Context. Exactly. Context. So a lot of those scholars, they don't know anything about esoteric doctrine. So they interpret things in a very literal manner. The cow represents the divine mother, and there even was a there was a there was even a five-legged cow found in, in uh, India that Blavatsky wrote about. Now the cow is a sacred symbol of the divine mother Kundalini, and even in the second surah of the Quran, you have Al-Baqarah, which means the cow, which is the longest surah of the Quran, in which traditionally in that in the Muslim tradition one would sing the, the Quran to recite. Quran means recitation. So the cow is really the power of the verb, the Divine Mother. So the cow, like in the myth of Mithras slaying the bull, he stabbed the bull in the throat. Meaning to conquer animal passion, you got to work with that sexual alchemy to kill that beast, that, that devolving serpent. And also the way we do it is with the cow, the Divine Mother. So the, the, the case, the, traditionally they would say the cow would, would have five, supposed to have five legs. There was a cow found with five legs, literally, in India. There's five aspects of the Divine Mother that I mentioned in the books that we have, which you can read more about. But the cow is, relates to Devi Kundalini. Healing also, I understand. Wow. And the, exactly. And the way that we heal is by working with our cow, by mantralizing, by working with that sacred power, and then like Mithras, killing the animal ego so that we can uh, unite with God. And my main emphasis is that don't accept this at face value, but really investigate this understanding of what past life, or, or understanding our past lives. Really investigate it within meditation, but also in, in the astral plane. I remember, for instance, I was, uh, I was with the Master Samael in Vior in the astral plane where I was trying to get help from him, and he kept telling me, you need to remember your past lives. And I was complaining, I was 
kind of whining. I'm like, I don't remember. At the, and this was years ago. I was like, I don't remember. He said, like, it doesn't matter. You need to know your past lives now is, because it's going to tell you about your current situation. So everything we do, have physically now is a result of our relationship to the past. Yes? Um, you said in al- alchemy you must be completely absent of lust. But with so much ego... Isn't it really hard to not even have like a lustful thought pop up? In we want to we want we want to strive to not have lust in the sexual act. In the beginning, uh-huh. it's it's it happen it, it's the, that's the way it is because we're ninety seven percent ego. Right. And is that a waste of energy then when you you avoid the fornication, but you have you do have like lustful thoughts that pop up? We want the, the, we have to work at our level. Okay. Wherever we're at, we have to work at. Okay, we're not we have to we have to understand that we're not going to be pure when we we're not going to perform this sexual act like saints yeah. we gradually train ourselves to do it like that okay. so in the beginning yeah, there's a lot of lust i would say practice in short increments to train the body and the mind and then progress prolong the act to so long as one can retain the energies you have to be at the same level spiritually mentally and physically to do that because if one is more inclined to you know the what do you call it what you mentioned the erotic or whatever that there's no there's no balance to that they have to be at the you same mean the two people well, Paul actually told me a really cool story about, because um, I was asking about that, and about a master who practiced with a non-believer, and he rose, and she, right? And she saw yeah. how he was glowing and said, now I want to do this too. But I don't think that they need to be it. Well, we need a, what's, what's important is that one has the potential to rise to the same level. But at the same time, we're at different levels of being. You can be very high up, and your partner could be struggling. I... Uh, you know, there's I, there's many stories about that with different initiates, mm-hmm. but it it really depends on our creative will, how we want to work in alchemy. If our partner is against it, but there's still love there, we can work, and then by our example, the other person can want to rise to our level. But whether or not one is compatible, that's another thing. You know, to, capable of rising to the same level, basically speaking. We can see. Yes, and like this is exactly what Paul of Tarsus taught in the Bible. How, uh, unbelieving, disbelieving husband, how do you not know that your wife will? Sa- how do you not know that your wife can, your disbelieving wife can be saved? Or uh, wife, how do you not know that your disbelieving husband will not be saved? Because uh, it is by being a good example, by working with our creative uh, will, is how we are going to change that. And that's a loving couple too. That- and it's a path of sacrifice. There, you know, of course. People think that mar- alchemy is gonna, when they get married, oh, it's going to be perfect and, and there's going to be no problems. People want to think like that, but the truth is, it's a crucifixion. But uh, one in which uh, one in which uh, we can redeem ourselves. Well, and then along with that, um, with sexual energy, at, she went on the summer. She was talking about how if you practice all day and then go watch TV, you've just wasted like all the energy that you cultivated. So there's a lot of other ways to waste that energy too, right? It dep- yeah, it, dep- it depends on our psychological state and how we invest our energy into certain projects. So you can save a lot of energy in alchemy, but then in a moment of anger, you say something really hateful, you lose all of that. Mm-hmm. It's possible. So the thing is to conserve the energy and to uh, restrain the mind. Because if we don't restrain the mind, if we don't have ethical discipline, then all the energy in the world is not going to save us. In fact, it'll make us more destructive, which is symbolized by the centaurs who are in the hell. They built solar bodies. They're half human, but they have a lot of animal. They didn't kill their ego compli- entirely, so they, they fall there. Happens. It's very common. Is that Nietzsche Yeah. It, uh, from what I know, yeah, that happened with Nietzsche. But uh, he, 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 let, he let himself fall intentionally. Oh, so but, uh, he went crazy? Yeah. Oh. Any more comments or questions, we'll uh, conclude. Or someone that you care about, and they're suffering, and they they need they need more help. And, you know, some of the Eastern traditions, there's a lot of stories, like in Buddhism, where you know a family member always burned incense, you know, for the Buddha or the gods or something like that, and that gave them a special blessing or favor for the person that was you know knee deep in debt, and that sort of cleared a lot of it. There's always certain things that could be done and that sort of thing, 
Well, uh, you know, we could say burning incense is helpful for our mental and emotional state. It doesn't absolve karma. There's some people who think that doing certain things is going to, oh, if you sing this mantra a million times, 101 times, you're going you're gonna to absolve your karma. It doesn't work like that. And it'll help you adjust your mental state so that you can face your karma with more strength. Yeah. So, uh, Isn't it, don't the gods uh, derive a great deal of see from being around those that, that uh, Master Somo talks about have, having incense in your room and things like that draws the master and, yeah it, it, attra it attracts yeah, superior forces you know. and uh, you know we always um, I think it was mentioned in the way of the Bodhisattva we'll conclude on this point the way of the Bodhisattva by Shantideva how anyone who begins to walk this path of initiation who is developing the soul within the gods look at that and they favor that they hail that individual as someone. Uh, finally, another soul is entering to the stream of nirvana. And uh, many times I've had experiences where I was with certain masters, and they were they were pleased. And you know, I'd like you know, lighting incense helps with that. But it accentuates, it strengthens one's prayer. But something you can verify internally that they're helping, because as soon as you're working with sexual energy and you're trying to restrain your mind, they come to you, and they will guide you internally. So I thank you all for coming. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.